Um, so welcome everybody. It's so great to see you again. We saw everybody last week, but welcome again. And thank you for joining us for our Love Your Lake session. Um, this is, I think, our third, right, Kathy, of the year? I think it is our third one of the year for 2024. So we're really, uh, really happy about all this. And uh, in case you don't know, my name is Kirsten. And I could introduce everybody to, the L uh, uh, to you, in case you don't know, the LKO board. So we've got Scott McPhee. Raise your hand, who's got? Nicely done, Scott. Scott Sharman is on your board. Lovely. Tanya. There we go, Tanya. Kathy Conlon. Oh, Wendy Hampson. And we've got Lance Payne. And we've got Dale. There we go. Oh, Gary, too bad, Gary. We can't introduce you. You used to be on the board, but you're not anymore. Oh, yeah, you, you're on mute. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <laughs> we love Gary. He was past president for many years and president for many years, put as many hours into the LKO. Anyway, I digress. We're really happy to be here today uh, and be with your LKO community. And as you know, these talks are meant to be informative and bring us together as in, in a community sort of way and help us learn how to protect our water and care for it and, uh, and its beautiful surroundings. Um, so we are so excited to have our guest speaker today, Dave Moffat, who will talk to us about safety on our lakes and let's enjoy it together. Um, as you all know, at the conclusion of this talk, we will ask questions, so feel free to use the chat function. Even as you go along, if a question comes up, put it in that chat function and we can get to it at the very end. Um, we will ask that everybody uh, mutes themselves and, and turns their video off once Dave starts, just so that the bandwidth is, is good and his reception will be seen far and wide. And as I mentioned, you do know this, that uh, um, he uh, Dave will be spotlighted, so we'll just see Dave full full on in his speech. But as a reminder, just in case you had forgotten, it is a recorded um, uh, session, and these ones will be available at a later time for you to watch on our L YouTube LKO channel. Um, so, um, without further ado, I'm going to introduce Tanya to do our land acknowledgement. <sighs> As we gather here today, we respectfully acknowledge that we are situated on the traditional territories of the Anaba, uh, Anishinaabe, Mississauga lands and the traditional territory covered by the Williams Treaty. Kashikwigamog, an Anishinaabe name, meaning the lake of long and winding water, served for millennium as an important passageway and meeting area for First Nation peoples. We are grateful for the opportunity to live here and we are thankful for all the generations of Indigenous people who have taken care of the lands for thousands of years. Thank you, Tonya. Um, and now I'd like to introduce you to Scott Sharman, who is going to uh, uh, introduce our guest speaker, Dave Moffat. Great. Thanks, Kirsten. And good evening, everyone, and thanks for joining us. Tonight's guest speaker is Sergeant Dave Moffat. Dave is a 28-year veteran of the Ontario Provincial Police who has dedicated the majority of his career to marine policing, mostly in Muskoka Lakes, Georgian Bay, and Lake Simcoe. He serves as a pr provincial marine coordinate, coordinator overseeing officer training, vessel deployment, and works with safety advocates, industry and government agency in support of safe boating activities. Welcome, Dave, and thanks for joining us. Thank you, everybody. I, uh, I, I'm quite honored that I'm the sole speaker here. Um, which is uh, quite exciting, actually. Um, uh, we this, as I was saying, it's about two years in the making. I was asked last year, and I just couldn't make it happen. And uh, so here we are, which is awesome. I am familiar with uh, your lake, quite familiar with your lake. Uh, I was, I was as a as a child, I worked in um, Big Hawk Lake, just north of you guys, as a, at a camp for many, many, many years. So. I just love the Halliburton Highlands, uh, and I spent some time at Min Minden Detachment as a sergeant. So it's uh, it was great working up there. So um, as uh, as I was introduced, I am the Provincial Marine Coordinator of the OPP. I've been uh, in this position for about six years. Sorry about the glare in my eyes, everyone. The, the screen's doing that. Um, and uh, so I am in charge of the basically everything marine at the at the provincial police level uh, and also as a liaison with Transport Canada and uh, you know the Canada Shipping Act that 
is used for uh, our, you know, our our laws is a federal law. So we, uh, it's been great to be in a position where I can talk to Transport Canada as well as talk to people across the country, enforcement officers, and uh, really determine if it's a good if the act needs a little adjustment or not. Um, today's uh, presentation, I'm going to um, put it up there. Um, I'm trying something new this, uh, I'm trying something new and I would like some participation. You can see right there, it says, please have your cell phone ready. Um, I am going to do a survey in about six slides in. And if you can have your cell phone where you'll just take your, your camera and you'll just uh, kind of on the camera app, there's a QR code that you can go over there. Then it will give you a little uh, link. You push the link and it will go to a survey. Um, again, you are guinea pigs. I've so never done this, so we'll see if it happens. Uh, so the, the provincial police, we have 380 officers, so about 170 vessels uh, across the province. Our vessels range from anywhere from a 14-footer all the way to a 38-footer that we keep down in uh, the Essex County, uh, Windsor area. Um, the officers are very, very dedicated. Uh, we, I think we have a fantastic Marine program around the province, even around the country. So uh, it's nice to talk to people around the country and, and learn about their Marine programs as well. So the uh, as far as stats go, we're just gonna talk about our enforcement after last year. Uh, a couple things I'd really like to highlight is number of vessel stops that we did. We we're, were close to 35,000 vessel stops across, uh, around the province. The Marine charges, uh, we're up from last year at 1,700, over 1,700. And then we had 437 approved screen devices, which which is the uh, the box that people low in. That's a very common term. It's an approved screen device. It's called a dragger, and that's looking for impaired drivers. And you can see that we uh, our impaired driving charges were a little bit down, but pretty much on par with last year. Uh, as far as our fatalities on our waters, we had 23 fatalities last year, but it was 22 incidents. Um, uh, 23, we, we it is a lower number, um, and we'll go into why it's a lower number. Um, but you can see it's you know over the past six years, you can see the numbers have gone all the way from 32 uh, down to a low of 18. Uh, 32, you can see is that's really mid pandemic um, where the you know, the, the number of vessels on our water just exploded. As far as uh, you can see that the second graphic there on the top is, it talks about where these fatalities happened in what region in Ontario. But the ones I wanted to show you was the bottom left. And it's talking about the ages of the deceased victims. And I, I don't know if you are aware, but there are there is a private members bill that's going around. It's called the Life Jackets for Life Act. And what um, what they're trying to uh, bring forward is that anyone under the age of 14 must wear a life jacket while in a vessel. I think any mandatory law is fantastic. However, you can see by this demographic that that is not, you know, under 14, we had absolutely no fatalities last year, and it accounts for uh, about 2% of our fatalities over 13 years. So the demographic, you can see it's quite uh, broad but the 65 to 74 years range. Um, you know, as the old uh, saying goes, and forgive me for saying this, but you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Uh, I would love to teach those old dogs that, you know, life jacket wear is is a must. It is, it is important to wear your life jacket. And then the last graphic, you can see that 96% uh, of our fatalities were males. And I always joke, I always joke with my wife that women are much smarter than men. So that's why. Um, so in the last nine years, and, and nine years, we started collecting really good data about nine years ago. And uh, so the last nine years, we've had 201 fatalities. And out of those 201, 178 of those fatalities were in vessels six meters or under, so 18 feet or under. We're talking about all paddle craft, canoes, kayaks, stand-up paddle boards, but also small fishing boats, uh, small pontoon boats, and just under that, that uh, I guess about 19 feet. But that's a pretty substantial number. It's over 88% of our fatalities are in vessels under six meters. Only 14 uh, vessels, 7% were vessels over that six meters. 
And we have about four and a half percent that uh, in the reports. And I tried and tried and tried to find out the uh, vessel size, but I just couldn't find it. The um, statistics in the last, last nine years, if we kind of break down all those fatalities, and there's two points that I want to really jump out. And, and the first graphic here you'll see is fatalities. And, and this is how we kind of um, break down our fatalities by these categories. And you can see that the first stat and the second one, falling overboard and capsizing, you know, it's almost, uh, what is it, 80% of our fatalities, over 80% of our fatalities. It's not about collisions. It's not, a, uh, you know, about um, falling in a boat or something. It's about falling out of the boat or capsizing. And we'll get a little more into that. Now, that's fatalities. So that's the 201 fatalities that we've had in the last nine years. As far as there's there's things called personally, personal injury collisions, which is PIs or personal in, uh, injury events, or PDs, which is property damage. So PIs or PDs. We had 380 incidences over nine years. Now, it doesn't seem a lot. Um, there is no reporting structure when it comes to any collisions on the water, unless it's a fatality. And that's because that it's deemed uh, a reportable incident under the Coroner's Act. So we only have 380 incidences, but you can see that falling overboard wasn't an issue, capsizing was an issue, but it's actually a collision. Collisions with other vessels, hitting islands, hitting shoals, not knowing where you are. And that took almost 80% of our collisions. So it's an interesting stat. What that tells me as a, a the provincial marine coordinator is that we have to do a better job in teaching people how to operate their boats. Um, driving a boat is not easy. There's there's no lines on the water, there's no brakes, uh, brake lights, et cetera. There's no signs. And you have to be on your game when when operating a vessel. So this is something that I'm really trying to get uh, going forward. So now we're on to the, the survey. So if I can ask you to take your camera and get into the camera app, and now if you can, now I understand that some people are on their cell phones and that might be a problem, but if you can take your camera and, and cover it over that um, QR code, you will see a little uh, link Click that link and it's go, going to go right to the survey and it's only six questions. So I would really uh, appreciate if you can do it. Um, we, you know, we can have a discussion afterwards. So we'll we'll pause for a couple of minutes while uh, we get this survey done. And I will get the. Okay, let's see how she looks. And here are the answers. We got one response. <laughs> one response. We're doing okay. Whoops. I'm still doing mine, so hang on. <laughs> no worries, no worries, no rush. And can everyone see that? You can see the responses here or no? Yes, yes, we okay. can. Thank you. Well, this is working dandingly. This is great. Not Thank bad you for, being for a my... pilot. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for being my guinea pig. I really appreciate it. I'm wondering, Dave, there's just some people that have just joined. If you wouldn't mind showing that QR code again, is that sure. possible? Yep. Uh, for those Absolutely. that are just doing, uh, he's, he's asking people if you're able to use there your you cell go. phone to scan the QR code to do this quick survey that he's just doing and the, the results are being tabulated on your screen. So if you're able to do that, please do that now. I think that's good, Dave. So you can start okay. showing the results, I think. Yep. Fantastic. Well, thank you for doing that. 20 responses. Fantastic. 
So um, I'm just very curious. Uh, as you can see, I am sitting here with a life jacket on. I am all about life jackets. I'll tell you a little, uh, a tiny little history of me. I used to be a high school teacher back in the day, back in uh, when I was 21. I turned, I became a high school teacher after graduating from McGill. And I did that for about five years. And then I had an opportunity to, um, uh, to join the OPP. And as in my previous life, I was lucky enough that my parents had a cottage in Muskoka. And I never wore my life jacket, ever, ever. It was just not something that was done. Um, when I became a police officer, and I became a Marine officer in the year 2000 and a Marine instructor in 2001, I learned to respect the water because of the terrible stuff that I uh, I saw. So I'm very interested on these, these surveys. I'm very, um, I'm always willing to spread my knowledge about wearing a life jacket and how important it is. I, I think you'll find this, this presentation quite interesting. Um, and it will take some of those uh, rumors uh, that you have about wearing life jackets and when you should wear life jackets. Um, you, maybe you'll have a different attitude. So let's look at the first question. How often do you wear your life jacket, PFD, while in a vessel? We have about half tank uh, sometimes, 34% um, always, and then 13% never. And granted, there's only 23 responses. So these could be really, uh, these, you know, these, these numbers could be ballooned a bit. Uh, number two, do you always wear your life jacket PFD for certain water sports, like a stand-up paddleboard, PWC, et cetera? 78% um, yes. Interesting. Next one, does the temperature of the water change your opinion about wearing a life jacket for PFT? That actually uh, really surprises me. It, it, a lot of people that I talk to say, you know, if it was cold out, like if it was, if it was the shoulder seasons, then I'm always wearing a life jacket. So like a third... Uh, so our two thirds say no, a third says yes. Uh, what is the reason that you don't wear a life jacket? I'm a good swimmer, 40%. Huge, huge answer by a lot of people. Uh, great, I always wear it, 30%. Not too far from my cottage. Um, I forget to put it on, 8% out of the reason. I couldn't really fit all the answers in there. And it's uncomfortable. I get that. It's uncomfortable. Uh, do you insist that children under 12 years old wear a life jacket PFD while in a boat with you? Very interesting. 100% of all of you said yes, absolutely. We let we children are the ones to wear it, and it's funny how we will protect our children, but we won't protect ourselves when it comes to life jacket wear. Uh, very very common. Everyone is. I will. I you know. I make sure my kids wear it for sure. And then the last one. Are you? Aware that there are life jacket PFD options on the market that wearing a life jacket more comfortable. So for you, 17%, we're going to talk about what I'm wearing I have on now and other options. So anyway, thank you very much. That uh, that was great, actually. Awesome. So we'll go back to the, um, the presentation. So now we're going to talk about life jackets. Uh, life jacket wear, this is over 13 years. We've been collecting data over 13 years when it comes to uh, fatalities, uh, wearing a life jacket or not. And this first stat shows you how many fatalities we've had since 2011. And you can see we've gone all the way up to 32 uh, and 18 is, is the lowest we had. Obviously one death is too many. Um, 23 is, I'm happy to say it's dropping, but obviously it's not dropping enough. So that's 312 fatalities we've had in the last 13 years. And this graphic is how many fatalities we've had with people not wearing life jackets. And if you look at that, you know, 73.9% last year, which actually is a lower stat, which is, you know, you look at 2022 where it's 93%. It's a bit of a win, but not even something to be excited about, right? Uh, but when you take the average of everything, it's almost 88% of our fatalities are not wearing life jackets. It's almost like the same stat where vessels under six meters, um, you know, that's where the fatalities are. It's a little lower when it comes to life jackets, but still almost 88% of our fatalities are not wearing life jackets. So I've been a Marine officer for a long time and I, I want to talk about these the PFD excuses that I've heard on the waters. And again, I've been on Lake Muskoka. 
a lot, a lot of my career I've been in Lake Muskoka. And then at the end of my, um, uh, before I became Marine coordinator, I was in Lake Simcoe and Georgian Bay as well. And these are the excuses I get. I am a good swimmer is the number one. It's, uh, uh, well, I'm a good swimmer and I, I live just right around the corner. My cottage is right there are, are two of the most um, used excuses. Doesn't fit well, I get a bad tan, never see the police here. I, I've had that lots. I'm surprised to see you here. Um, I don't have to wear it, that's true. They're under the seat. You know, they're in a bad place in the boat. I've actually had someone tell me on Lake Muskoka, the reason why he doesn't have life jackets in his boat is because his help gets the boat ready and they, his help must have not put the boat or the life jackets in the boat. Um, but it, that, those excuses are just people that uh, don't really, you know, they're, they're not really prepared to go out on the water because, you know, if you don't have your life jackets, then obviously that's a big issue. But it's also if you don't have your life jackets uh, available to you, that's another huge issue. The bottom row, I want to talk about the different types of life jackets. And um, so if I look at this, uh, this one here, so the, this is the one I'm wearing. It's an inflatable life jacket. And this life jacket actually, um, you know, if it's the automatic kind, then if you fall in the water, it will blow up. It will pull into a life jacket and it will blow big so that you would come to the surface instantly. Very good life jacket. Very, very comfortable. Um, it's, you know, I I swear by them. Obviously, I bought my own. I have one at home here. Um, it is a great piece of kit. The second one is called a small vessel life jacket. And this is what is used in small commercial vessels. It's very cumbersome. It's big, heavy. The next one is a per, uh, personal flotation device, which is the ones that most cottages have in their boats that uh, are under the seat. This yellow one, is a either a, a you know can be a paddling life jacket or a stand-up paddle life jacket but very comfortable you can see the the wide arm areas so you don't bind up with the life jacket underneath your arms very good one this is another inflatable that i have here this might be a manual inflatable that uh you actually have to yank on a on a cord to make it go so if you fall in the water you actually have to do something to make it go off we don't recommend that one because uh, obviously if you hit your head and you fall in the water, then that thing is not going off. There's another paddle life jacket, which is great. Another style. It's like a Salas style. And this last one have been, has been approved by Transport Canada. It is a pouch style life jacket. So you put it on around your waist. And when you go stand up paddle boarding or whatever sport you want to do, canoeing, and if you go into the water, then you pull on that yellow tab and it will blow up into a life jacket and you actually have to put the life jacket over your head. It's not ideal, but it is great. Uh, you know, if we get people to wear those, great. And they don't want to wear a heavy life jacket, then by all means, but at least you have a life jacket with you. Awesome, awesome piece of equipment. So I wanted to, um, you know, talk about the um, those items and to, you know, for those 13 or 14% that didn't know there's other items out there. There are a ton of items that you can buy that makes you wearing a life jacket uh, kind of a natural thing. So we looked at our uh, 2023 marine fatalities in our waterways, 22 instances and 23 fatalities. And again, if we look at our stats, most of them are 21 incidents, uh, uh, 66 meters or under. And the one incident of over six meters, this was a... Um, a 24 foot vessel that uh, was a high rate of speed on, on the St. Lawrence river. And it's, it was one of those pickle fork vessels and the wind caught it underneath and flipped the boat. And, uh, and that's the one incident that, um, that is the vessel uh, over six meters. So again, most of our stats are at six meters or under. This is our contributing factor. So again, falling overboard and capsizing are the two biggest uh, pieces, right? We're looking at 90%, 91% is fall over or capsizing. And then we had two actually collisions uh, causing fatalities. And then the vessel types. So we have the top three are motor boats or motorized boats. And the bottom four are uh, muscular power. So it is usually, usually it's half and half uh, between the two. Um, but uh, last year was a little more. 
So if we take that stat, just to give you, like, I don't want to be doom and gloom here. I just want to give you a, an idea of some of the things that happened throughout the province that, you know, as a Marine coordinator, I, I read all the reports, I hear all the reports, I talk to officers, um, but just, I'm going to talk about the different instances and the types. I'm not doing 22 by any means, but so the, uh, the first one I want to talk about, it was in a motorboat. It was a fishing boat that capsized and sank with four occupants. Uh, one occupant drowned while attempting to swim to shore. Strong swimmer, a very, very strong swimmer. No PFDs on board the vessel. So again, they were actually got on the lake. Four friends from the city got on the lake to do, do um, uh, some fishing. And when the boat took on water, the, the PFDs were still sitting in the pickup truck at the ramp. A uh, pontoon boat, or sorry, uh, this is another motorboat, went out fishing motorized vessel, never returned. We located the deceased with the life jacket around his arm. He couldn't actually put the life jacket on at that time, but we located him uh, by the vessel with a life jacket just through his arm. Um, PwC crash, two random PwCs collide, one deceased, PFDs worn. And then another one, a uh, gentleman fell off a PwC and never resurfaced, no PFD. Um, this canoe, uh, friends on a camping trip, two fishing in a canoe at high winds, capsized, and one did not resurface, uh, no PFD. So again, a tragic, tragic event. Friends out camping, having a great time, and vessel capsized, no PFDs worn, and one doesn't surface. Uh, this is in a kayak, a male found by a kayak capsized, wearing a manual inflation uh, PFD, but it did not inflate. So... Again, he's wearing one of these that I have, but it's a manual one. And he obviously went in the water. And there's reasons why he couldn't access the tab. Um, and we'll talk about that in a couple slides, okay? Uh, rowboat, this was a, a group of friends that went to a B, uh, Airbnb. They found a rowboat on the property. They brought it down to the lake. One of the friends wanted to uh, get in there. There was already three people in it. And the fourth, um, he wanted to jump in with it, and as he stepped on the gunnel to get in the boat, he capsized the boat, and he never surfaced. And the last one uh, was this: wanted to try an SUP at a at a ramp, and uh, stand up paddleboard. And he he was in, you know, his friends were telling him to wear a PFD, wear a PFD, and he didn't want to wear one, so he fell in shallow water, and he got back up, went a little farther out, he fell again, and he he didn't surface. So tragic, tragic, tragic events, okay? So, and again, I'm talking about PFDs. A lot of these incidents would never have happened if a PFD was worn and trying to get that, that, um, that message across. Now, I did something really interesting uh, with the Canadian State Boating Council with, and Transport Canada. I was involved in this study. It was called the sh shock factor. And you can see the poster, it says one boater, one boater will drown each day during bonus season this year. Could you survive the sur surprise of an accidental fall overboard? So I uh, went down to a, uh, a place down in Keswick and they had this whole event set up. And what it does, if you can see the videos, two of the videos, the top left and the bottom right, were VR videos. So the top one was, I was on a uh, stand-up paddleboard and the bottom one or the bottom right was I was fishing and I was reaching down to get the fish and I fell overboard. They have actually a release hatch that makes you fall off. And they they uh, get all this data from this exoskeleton kind of shirt that I'm wearing under my t-shirt. And it, it, it's a great shirt because it really accentuates the fat that I'm holding there. But um, so it's, it, gets a hold, like it, it uh, takes data on your breath and it takes data on your uh, your pulse rate. The, the bottom left and the top right were pools that automatically they, um, they, you're involved in a conversation, it's a comfortable conversation, and then at no time you enter the water involuntarily. Even though you know it's coming, you are surprised by it. One, uh, the bottom left one, I believe, is 16 degrees, and the top right one is 35 degrees. So big difference. And a lot of people think that 
you know, I'll wear a life jacket when it's cold, when I have cold water, but um, but we also did one at the 35 degrees. So interesting information here. My increased heart weight, so the red circle was about the VR experiences and the purple circle was about the uh, getting doused in that water. And um, just gonna move this, excuse me. So, um, sorry, okay. So the ventilation was a big piece. My Obviously my heart rate increased drastically during the two events in the water. I'm gonna talk about the water. Um, ventilation, uh, ventilation increased by 65% for both SUP and the, um, the dunk tanks, or sorry, in the uh, fishing. But when it came to the dunk tanks, my ventilation increased 180% for the warm water and only 110% for the cold water. And I was dunked in the cold water first. So it's not like I'm, I'm used to being dunked. It was 110% for the cold water and 180% for the warm water, which is surprising. But again, it's an involuntary entrance into the water. And what we can relate that to is if um, the gas reflex increases substantially, and that can relate to if you're under the water and you do a gas reflex, you are not going to surface. And it doesn't matter what the temperature of the water is. So that was a huge eye opener for myself, who always wears a light jacket, but for also a lot of people that I, I give this presentation to that they are surprised that, you know, a 35 degree lake, which is any one of our lakes in, in July, um, would do that, would give me that gas reflex. And you can see my, my heart rate went from 103 beats per minute to 134 beats per minute instantly in the warm pool. So uh, that gas reflex could be deadly, simple as that. So the bottom line is when you do that, obviously you enter the water uh, involuntarily, panicking anxiety skyrockets. Um, you're trying to, you know, if you have a manual light jacket, you're trying to get the, the light jacket to go. Your, your heart rate is high, you're gasping for air. Um, and I think with all that in mind that, you know, bottom line is you got to respect the water. Simple as that. The water, be under, understand the water can take your life away in a matter of seconds. So, uh, you know, wearing a life jacket is probably the, the best thing you could do. So what do we, what do I say to people that own cottages or people that have residences by the lake? I say be cottage smart. And how do you be cottage smart is you make good decisions. And it's amazing how people don't make good decisions. Like, you know, unfortunately those kids in, and we've had occurrences in B&B &B where they go canoeing at night in a windstorm and um, a capsize and they don't return. But to make good decisions, there's a couple of things or a handful of things that you need to, you know, think about. And it's but wearing a life jacket, respecting the water, no booze or drugs, plan ahead, be aware about the cold water, get passengers engaged. So if you have passengers on your boat, let them also be eyes for you and be a good operator. And with the arrows going back and forth, these are not decisions you make just on shore. These are decisions you make the whole time that you're out on the, uh, the lake. Um, so another thing I do talk about when it comes to cottages is about shared waterways. And shared waterways is a huge, huge piece because, you know, we have the people that are on PWCs that, you know, like to go out at six in the morning, uh, or they like to do donuts in your bay. Um, we also have those, those uh, you know, wakeboard boats that are have heavy ballast. And they, you know, they are causing problems with, with shoreline erosion, with damage to docks, et cetera. Um, but also on that end, that those people that are doing those, those uh, sports, are, are, you know, they have as much right to do those sort of sports as, as you have much, much right to enjoy your cottage and the quietness of your cottage. So we need to find a happy medium uh, with a shared waterway. And, you know, really basically it's about finding a common grounds for enjoyment. We need to all work together and find that common ground that we can agree to 
to make everyone happy about being on the lake. And this is not just Kashiwa. This is every lake in the province that has these issues, every single one. So the first thing, and it's hard to teach this, but it's about courtesy. And you know, the courtesy by definition, and this is something I pulled out of the uh, the uh, encyclopedia or as the um, dictionary, the showing of politeness in one's attitude and behavior towards others. So we need to think about other people, not about you know, I've rented a BNB. I've paid a lot of money for that BNB. I'm going to enjoy my time to the fullest at that BNB, and I don't really care about anyone around me because I'm only here for a week. We need to teach people about courtesy, and it's so hard to do because they don't understand it. Um, be, you know, people that have been there for a long time need to, uh, you know, to you know, they like they're they're going to get mad. Absolutely. So we need to find that common ground. Um, wake management is a really big piece and wake management is about, you know, the two things about wake and wash. So wake is what comes out from the back of your boat and wash is what comes across onto the shoreline, which is causing all the erosion. Um, it is the responsibility. Those wakes are the responsibility of the, uh, the operator. And what a lot of people don't know is that they are responsible for any damage that's caused by those wakes. Uh, it also, you know, with shoreline, with wildlife as a problem, also swimmers. Like, we have to understand that people are using the lake, and, and just because you're wakeboarding doesn't mean that you own the lake. So we have to find that common ground, the courtesy piece. But if that person is, you know, it's not a police matter, unfortunately, but it is a civil liability issue that if there's damage caused by the wake, and I understand there's a, um, what I've been told, there's a camp on the lake that you're trying to, trying to work this out, trying to find this common ground. Um, they are responsible for their wake by civil liability. Also the 1030 rule, which is a speed limit at, in effect all through Canada. It is basically says if you're 30 meters from shore, you must go 10 kilometers an hour. So 10 kilometers an hour is not it's not plowing. It means it's down, no wake. Simple as that. Okay. There are a couple exceptions when it comes to that. Uh, recreational towing, where a boat follows a path of 90 degree angle away from the shore. So if you are uh, towing a skier, wakeboarder, you can leave your dock at a 90 degree angle away from shore. And that's no problem. You can't return him the same way. You have to stop uh, 30 meters out from the dock. And then pick up this uh, the the uh, tower from uh, the water. Also, if it's in, which I don't think you have, but in rivers less than 100 meters in width or can canals or in buoy channels. So there's really, um, which is a uh, unbelievable law. I still can't shake my head around it. But if it is a river less than 100 meters in width or or canal or in buoy channels, then there's no speed limit. So, which is odd. Okay. So what can you do as a, an association? So there's a couple things down on the right-hand side. I have a picture of a 911 on a cell phone, uh, what three words, and we also have a control buoy that says slow, no wake. And we're gonna talk about those in a second. So to contact the OVP, there's there's basically with the uh, Kashaga Wigamog, there's three options there. It's star 16, that's how you get to uh, the Coast Guard. Don't think we're going to have a Coast Guard uh, response to Kashaga Wigamog. But to contact the OVP, please, if it is a non emergent call, please use the 1888 310 1122. That number should be posted in your cottage somewhere. And that's non emergent. Okay. Now, if you find you need the police ASAP and it's not because of someone towing and there's big waves, that there's an impaired boater, that there's been a collision, that et cetera, et cetera then by all means call 911 and we will get people there ASAP because that that obviously call, that call takes priority. So please uh, learn the two different numbers, okay? Or star OPP goes to our comm center and that is a non-emergent number. Uh, if you have a VHF, channel 16, like I said, goes to the Coast Guard. Uh, there is no Coast Guard response in Kashaga Um, But also if you, 
if you really want, you know, if you want to talk to an officer and get some advice, et cetera, then the local detachment is fantastic. Uh, you just leave a number for, you know, the, the detachment is open from eight to four Monday to Friday. Um, and you'll leave a message on the answer machine. But if you call that triple eight three ten eleven twenty two, and you still want to speak to an officer officer on a weekend, or um, that will go straight to our dispatch. Now, what is the information we need from you? If you see a boat that's operating dangerously, that you need, you know, this you, you need police response, then in order for us to do something as a reactive me uh, measure, we need you to make sure you have the five Ws. Okay, who, what, when, where why or how um what exactly is happening we need to know who that is for prosecution we need identification we need to know who that accused is but if you tell us it was that red boat and i i know it's the red boat because it has this little black decal on the side and it went into that boathouse then we will go to that boathouse and if you describe the person to us then that's all we need okay we need to we can we can work on that um you know, you'll need, if, if you want this person charged and you want to go to court, you will be a witness and we will need you to identify the accused in court because we're not there. Um, if you have an issue, obviously call us because who knows, we might just be around the corner. We might, we might be in the lake or we might be around the corner at another lake that we can pop out of that lake and come into your lake. ASAP. Okay, so don't be, um, don't think that, you know, uh, the call the police, nothing's going to happen. It is about timing. It is about uh, the proper information we get. It's about the staff we have. Okay. And if it's not emergent, then we will definitely follow up at a later time. So please keep that under your hat um, because it is, uh, it's important that we, you know, we respond to your complaints. Now, the What Three Words app, I don't know if anyone has used it um we so what basically what the what three words app is there was um uh this this gentleman from oh my gosh i think it was in great britain uh a uh, professor right there he divided the world up into 57 trillion squares and he used 40,000 uh, 40,000 words and each square is divided into three words so if you're in your house you'd have three different words in your bathroom compared to three different words in to your front door. So what's great about this is that if you give that municipal, municipal number where it's like 23, um, you know, it might be LK 47, then we have to look it up. What the, what three words app will do is you give those three words to the dispatcher, she'll plug them in and bango, we know exactly where you are. So it's a fantastic app. We've used it many times. Uh, a very good example is on um, Lake um, Kuchiching. We had a snowmobile that hit a pressure crack and crashed uh, in the middle of a snowstorm. And he calls us on his cell phone. Cell phone was dying. We, that would have taken us hours and hours and hours to find him the old traditional way. He was... Uh, he was given a, a link by the dispatcher. He pushes the button, tells him what the three words are. And then we found this person uh, within 50 minutes of leaving the shoreline. So very, very quick access to any kind of, uh, you know, um, response from a police fire or ambulance. Um, education. Education is the biggest piece. Obviously, I believe in it. Social media, retweets, your post. Talk about your lake, talk about the fantastic things that happen on your lake, and maybe remind people about the other things that you would like to see change. But again, it's that co coercion between, you know, people that uh, have been there for a long time and people that are doing that because they kind of have to because of uh, business or uh, or they're just, you know, they're there, there for a week. So we need to find that happy medium. Uh, signage is very important um you can see that picture slow down no wake or slow no wake that sign is an information buoy meaning that there is no charges that are available to that for one it's something that transport canada did not put in but there's no such thing as no wake because it is you know no wake could mean a lot of things so 
when we have the not the 10 kilometer an hour speed limit that's something we can work with and what we've done in the past is if someone's uh up on plane within that speed limit zone like through a channel through a river etc then as long as that boat's up on plane we can lay a charge okay so again that's part of the evidence that we can get from you slow down bow down is a great uh tagline as well um and then i i always say this uh again i, I can't stress enough please wear your pft lead by example as board members they uh, they very much do save lives uh we are getting more and more people to wear them however we have a huge huge uh way to go to make sure you know to, to try, to, try to get more and more people uh to wear them um that is it as far as my presentation that is my uh, email address down at the bottom so if you do have any questions whatsoever, I, I'm more than happy to receive your emails and uh, I always respond to them. It might take me a day or two, depending on what, what I'm doing, but I will always respond to your emails and, um, and get the information you need. So, and that is it. So if you want to take that down, I'll leave it up for two seconds. Thank um, you. And if we have any questions? Yeah, so at this point in time, everyone, first of all, thank you, uh, Dave. That was very informative. Um, if anyone has any questions that they wanted to ask, uh, Dave, if you want to put it in the chat function and then we can uh, deal with it that way. Um, but uh, very um, informative and convincing uh, uh, stories, you know, real life stories that make you mm -hmm. want to uh, wear that life jacket. Um, yeah. And unfortunately, I think that that's what we need as adults is those those, those life stories that are devastating, unfortunately, yeah. to get yeah. that point across. So yeah. I'm not all doom and gloom. I'm a pretty happy guy, pretty nice guy. <laughs> but I, I just, I am so, I so much believe in it. And I'm so passionate about people wearing life jackets. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Anyway. So here's a question that's come in. Is excess noise from Powerball power boats or i rather does excess noise from power boats fall within opp consideration um okay so excess noise can mean a lot of things like uh, first of all let me talk about mufflers let me talk about loud boats like a you know a donzi that has straight pipes um mufflers right now mufflers are very uh it's a broad thing in the Canada shipping act 2001 you have to you have basically your boat has to have a muffler but a muffler is very vague very very vague so what we're working on right now with transport canada and with the safe and quiet uh quiet lakes over at the um uh, it's an organization with the mla and and they're actually a national organization fantastic they are really pushing ahead for a decibel reading for boats and i truly believe it will happen eventually um, but it's not there quite yet. And, and to get these laws changed, it does take uh, more than a few years to do that. But Transport Canada is very interested in doing their own research and they're learning from the research of the Safe and Quiet Lakes. It's called the Decibel Coalition, actually. It's not Safe and Quiet Lakes, excuse me, but the Decibel Coalition. Um, and that's one. So that's mufflers. When it comes to loud stereos and loud you know that's a byline issue that is that is nothing new with the Canada Shipping Act 2001 and unfortunately if it's after 11 then bylaw can do something about that but we can we we cannot do anything about a loud stereo that's again down to that courtesy piece you can't teach courtesy and that's why we 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 try to teach it and we try to explain to people about it but it's very very hard to do that Ah, thanks, Dave. Another question we've got. Thanks, Dave. Great presentation. Can you shed some light on the alcohol and the stats? So sure. Okay. So okay. believe it or not, alcohol is a very small amount of this. Small amount of the fatalities. Do you think the slogan um, beer on the pier uh, has, yeah. Uh, yeah. has really that? I'm going to say it is around the, with the, um, the 13 years of stats, I think it's around, I think it's around 4%, something wow. very low, very, very low. But it's interesting. I see one of the, the comments about, um, you know, 
do you find these men with their pants down? And which means that, you know, they're urinating off the side of the boat usually. And we, we kind of deduce that that's happening. Yes, that does happen. Um, and we do find uh, very few that do that, but there are occurrences that do that. So mm. it is about, you know, for instance, uh, you know, another occurrence, uh, two gentlemen in a boat, they're in a 14 foot tin boat. He goes to sit back, kind of a heavier guy. He goes to sit back. And as he sits back, because he's the operator of the boat, the, the back corner of the boat dips under the water. And just very innocent stuff. They've been fishing for years. Very, very innocent stuff. And it might have been just the way the wind was blowing that day or, you know, just the way um, stuff was put in the boat. And where was his partner? Was his partner in the bow or the stern? Like, there's so many things that, you know, it's Murphy's Law. Like, if it, if it can go wrong, it will go wrong. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. it's, it's very, you know, very low number. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. Are, are more boats required to slow down when passing a vulnerable boat like a canoe? They don't seem to anymore. Any thoughts about yeah. that? Uh, so are they required to slow down? They are not. Um, they, uh, I, yeah, it's just, you know, I, I, get it. I get it. And some of these boats are huge. You look on YouTube and you can see these, you know, if you think we have problems, you look at the YouTubes from Miami. They have mm -hmm. problems down there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. They, you know, it it is it is so unfortunate that people do not look around because there's so many boats on the lake. They don't look around at the traffic around them. If if I'm operating a boat, then and I see a canoe, then I'll either change my course and I'll go around wide around the canoe, stay at plane, not plowing. I'll stay, you know, up on plane. Or if I'm going near them, staying with a pen and stand up paddleboard, I will drop it down off plane and I'll put by them. Because my wake, and as I explained, you are responsible for your wake, my wake can very much affect those operators. Mm -hmm. So it's important to kind of teach yourself those courtesy rules as an operator. Sure. And there's another question to go along with that question is, are right of way violations something that OPP can charge people with? Yes. Um, so one thing I, you know, I, I do a collision regulations, maybe I'll come back and do this, but um, <laughs> the collision regulations under the Canada Shipping Act 2001 are very clear with rights of ways. So, uh, you know, there's a starboard side, there's a port side, someone at whichever side you're on, then you get the right of ways. However, it also says in the Canada Shipping Act that even though there's all these great rules, you're allowed to break the rules if you're going to avoid a collision. And no one can get in a collision. Like uh, I've had, I've had occurrences where we have very stubborn individuals that are driving across the lake and they're, they're looking at a boat that they think there's going to be an intersection, you know, and they're going, I got the right away. I'm not, I'm not moving. I, I got the right away. The other boat has to move. And uh, this one occurrence, he came right off the stern of this boat. And guess what? That boat was towing a laser sailboat oh. and caught the line and ran over the laser sailboat. And could you imagine if a child was on that? Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so it is, yes, we can, there has to be very, very, um, uh, very, very good reasons to do that. Uh, there's a couple of great charges in the, in the collision regulations. The one is, you know, rule five is called, and it's called fail to keep proper lookout. So if you get an collision by any means, you have not been, you, you know, you, you're sitting in your, your seat and you're driving your boat and you might have your wife with you or a friend or something and you haven't given them any any role in the boat, then that's a very good fail to keep proper look at because we need to we need to see what's around. So um yeah, learning yes. the information is important and and that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, interesting, yeah. interesting. How often do you think the does the OPP patrol our lake is one of the questions. Good question. I can't answer that because I'm not uh, I'm not aware of the patrol hours on uh, with the Halberd Highlands Detachment. That's something that you'll have to get from them. Okay, sounds great. Is there a difference between the PFD and the life jacket? Are PFDs legal? Yes. So, what uh, if I look at if I show you mine, right in in the inside, you'll see a bunch of writing, and every PFD and life jacket should have writing. And one of the things that makes it legal and make sure you look for this is that it says transfer Canada approved or Canadian Coast Guard approved. Okay. If it doesn't have that, like 
a lot of the water skiing vests don't have that. They are water skiing vests. And to make them approved, they have to have a certain buoyancy value. Okay, like 70 Newton value, like a amount of air and how much how much it's going to lift you from the water. And and water ski vests don't have that. So if you have someone wearing a water ski vest, then you have to have another PFD on board or life jacket on board to count for that person you're towing. It's not law that whoever's you're towing has to wear a life jacket. It's not law. You just have to have one in the boat for that person. So the difference between them, a PFD is a is like a jacket. And basically the big difference is a personal flotation device. If you fall in the water and you are knocked unconscious, it will not keep your head out of the water. Simple as that. So you'll fall in the water and you will drop your head. And there's a very good chance that your face will be in the water and you will drown. A life jacket is, um, is something that will turn you over and keep your head above water. Okay. And I think that these things here will do that. They will turn you over and keep your head above water, but they were called a personal flotation device. So I don't, mm -hmm. I don't know, mm -hmm. but it doesn't, I think it's just the, the buoyancy piece. Um, but these will definitely turn you over and put your head uh, uh, available to, for the airway. And just to further that, how old can a life jacket be before you should replace it? Great question. Really, really good question. Uh, the, when you look at the, uh, so Muskoka Lakes, for instance, we have the old mahogany boats. They're trying to keep it in that era. And they have these old K-pop yeah. life jackets with horse hair in them. Yeah. They've got these <laughs> stamped. They look like they're from the army. Yeah. They are fine as long as they work. And I mean, like, it can't have any rips in them. It can't have any uh, straps missing. And the big thing is that you can read that it is it is actually approved through transport. Wow. If this wow. is all damaged and you can't read in here, mm -hmm. then throw them out. So yeah. a PFD has to be in great shape and a, okay. and a life jacket, a great shape for it to count. And okay. you know, when you get stopped by the police or if you get stopped by the police, ask them. Ask them, say, hey, look, I've got some PFDs on board or life jackets. Can you tell me if these are still good? Right. Perfect. Um, we've got a last sort of comment. Someone was asking, or you you were going to tell us something about the man who drowned with a life jacket around his arm. Were you going to tell us something about that? Yeah. So the are the the one with the inflatable life jacket. Um, I think so. Yes. Yeah. So we've had a couple uh, occurrences in the last three or four years that uh, people these are not cheap. They are no. not cheap. They're two hundred plus, but what's your life worth? And this is why I went out and bought one because I love them. And I've, I've actually gone to dinner with my wife, you know, I'd come home from a long day on the, on the water, 12 hour shift, 15, 13 hour shift, whatever. I'd come to dinner and my wife looks at me and goes, are, are you taking that PFD off? Like <laughs> I'm so, it's so comfortable. It is so comfortable. And that's, what's great about these, uh, these pieces, but the, it's an automatic inflator. So if you fall in the water, it's going to blow. But this here is also the tab where I can pull on that and it will blow, okay? So, um, hang on a second. Oh, there we go. Look at that. Okay. So look at that. Yeah. Pull on it and it inflates. And this is this will keep my head above water, Yeah. okay? So- And then um, how do you deflate it? You Now you what you do is you take this off. Yeah. This is, and the nice thing is the new ones are very lime green. Um, so, so uh, you know, search and rescue can find you. You also have a whistle, but, and then to get, to deflate it, you just pull them out. And, and as you put your finger in there, it will come off. Okay. So, and it's only a, you know, if you get a, um, it's a recharge kit, you don't have to throw out the whole PFD. It's just a, a $30 recharge kit that, can get the, the light jacket working again. Mm, as someone was just asking, wondering whether or not, thank you for demonstrating that. Is there a certain place to buy them? Uh, you know, I mean, other than I guess your marina. Yeah, um, Canadian Tire has them. Uh, yeah. Pro, there's a great sports store in Aurelia called um, Trombley's Tackle Box. They'll sell them. You can get them online. Be careful what you buy. Um, there's inflatable light jackets that are Transfer Canada approved at Costco fantastic but they are not made with the material that the new life jackets are made with so 
a, a colleague of mine bought two of them. He has a place in Perry Sound. He was so excited. He wore them all weekend. It was great, you know, having a great time. And then as he left, he hung them on the back seat of his boat and he zipped up his boat. And when he came back, they were both exploded because oh, the moisture had got geez. through the 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 weak, um, you know, just the the material that that would happen. On the ones I have, that doesn't happen. So wow. it's you know, so two hundred dollars or more for these. If you get a manual one, and back to my story, if you get a manual one where you have to pull on the thing, um, those are about half price. They're about maybe a hundred dollars. However, the manual. So we have we have unfortunately recovered persons on the bottom of the lake that are wearing these manual life jackets, and you know that I hope that kind of says a lot about a manual life. Jacket. Yeah, it does. It does. Yeah. Um, it, um, I just wanted to at this point in time, Dave, welcome everybody back. If you choose to turn on your video. Um, welcome people back in. Um, uh, there doesn't seem to be any other questions, but I just thought that more faces Dave can see now um, and we could all give Dave a big round of applause for an amazing uh, presentation. So here comes all these. So you can see all these people that are here watching your uh, presentation. And I'll just give the floor over to uh, Scott now to give you our sincere thanks. Fantastic. I don't think Bill, Bill Dimitrenko hasn't seen, I haven't seen his lovely face yet. Oh, um, yeah. I, I think he's got to be here. Um, I, I see him. I saw him at the uh, sportsman show over the weekend. So he okay, said, then. there he is. Hey, Bill. Nice to see you. <laughs> there you go. Uh, thanks, Kirsten. On behalf of the Lake Association board members and all our members and friends who are able to join us tonight, thank you, Dave, for presenting this evening on an extremely important subject. We know you're busy and, and in demand and we appreciate you setting time aside to be part of our speaker series. Uh, for everyone's um, information, as usual, we uh, provide our presenters with an honorarium. Um, and in this case, Dave has graciously offered to uh, donate his uh, honorarium back to our association. So again, thank you, Dave. I know everyone appreciates um, when we have the opportunity to have the police present to us and, uh, and it was an awesome presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, again, it was an honor to do it. Um, I just loved speaking to, uh, such passionate people about their lakes. So enjoy the summer, have a fantastic, uh, well, it doesn't feel like spring right now, but, uh, it will, it will you'll soon be available or up there and, and enjoy their lakes. So have a safe summer, everybody, and, and, uh, take care of yourself. Thank you so much. And, and Scott, thank, you. Just, thank you so much, Dave. Thank you so much. I just wanted to remind the rest of our LKO members that Dr. Chris Hauser of the University of Waterloo will be presenting on April the 17th at 7.30. And he will be presenting the results of the uh, boat, boat wake study uh, that he did. Uh, Lake Kishagawigmog was one of the lakes that he monitored last summer. So he'll be presenting those results. So it should be a very interesting topic. So I just wanted to remind everyone, April 17th, same time, same station, you'll register and you'll be able to get the link. But uh, thank you again to Dave Moffitt and, and to the LKO board for making all this happen for everybody. Have a wonderful evening. Thanks folks. Thanks so thank much. You. If the board members could just